Welcome everyone to a webinar entitled Bridging the Chasm, Quantum Mechanics in Christian Spirituality with presenters Dr. Robert Curland and Dr. Terence Lagerland. My name is Sebastian Mahfoud and I'm the director of iTest. The Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, iTest, is an association of theologians, scientists, and others committed to a Catholic worldview in which faith and science collaborate in exploring the truth. iTest explores truth theologically in the wisdom traditions of the human community and in the data studied in the sciences. iTest's mission is to foster and disseminate the Catholic position that science and faith in God are complementary paths to human fulfillment. Before I introduce our first presenter, Sister Carla May Streeter, a Dominican sister and Professor Emerita at Aquinas Institute of Theology, will lead us in our opening prayer. Sister Carla May. Good morning, everyone. And so a moment of quiet as we bless this precious time. Most Holy One, great bridge builder, you who stretched yourself from heaven to earth and did not disdain becoming one of us. In your great mercy, bless this time, bless our speakers. Help us all to learn how you intend to bring unity in truth. We ask the presence of your spirit Fill us with your breath, and may this webinar give you great joy. We pray in the name of the one you've given us to show us the way home. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Carla May. And now I'm delighted to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Robert Curlin, a convert to Catholicism in 1995, is a retired physicist who has applied magnetic resonance to problems of biological interest in his research. He began to learn about quantum mechanics at Caltech and Harvard, where he received his Bachelor of Science and his PhD, respectively, from courses taught by Richard Feynman and Julian Swinger, in teaching quantum mechanics to students at Carnegie Mellon and SUNY, he found that mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics was an obstacle to understanding. So in his talk, he would try to explain what quantum mechanics is about using a minimum of mathematics, as he did in his book, Mysteries, Quantum and Theological. Dr. Curlin's presentation is entitled, Touring the Wonderland of Quantum Mechanics. Dr. Curlin, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Mahfoud, and thank you all for being here. Before I begin the uh, slide presentation, let me just make a few preliminary remarks. Uh, those of you with uh, teenage children, or possibly I should say uh, you yourselves, are familiar with concerts, not classical music concerts, but popular music concerts in which a big name is preceded by what's called a warm-up band. So I am the warm-up band for Dr. Lagerland. I'm going to uh, say a few things about quantum mechanics, discuss its mysteries, principally the mystery of superposition and entanglement, and try to show these in a pictorial, non-mathematical way, and then just make a few remarks about how quantum mechanics and these mysteries might relate to Catholic teaching. In the bottom left corner, you see the... Uh, cover of my book, Mysteries, plug, 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 shameless self-promotion. And uh, when I first started writing this and showed uh, the first bits to my wife, she said, my stomach hurts. It's too mathematical. So this was the lesson to me to make things pictorial and qualitative and try to remove the mathematics, even though the mathematics is an integral part of what quantum mechanics is all about. So our goal is to discuss these mysteries, superposition, entanglement, and how they might relate to quantum teaching, uh, to Catholic teaching. At the right, 
Laura Corner, you see a picture of two beryllium atoms, which are entangled. One is irradiated, and the other, at a far distance away, shows the same effect. That's one of the mysteries, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Now, before we begin, I'd like to make a few remarks about fundamentals. And one of the most fundamental physical aspects is wave motion. You know a wave is an up and down disturbance. You see it in the bottom left-hand picture. A bee is scattering its wings in water and sending waves through the water. The height of the wave is here, and then it goes down, and then it goes there. And if you look at a traveling wave, such as would be here, it moved forward with a velocity commonly denoted by the letter C. The distance between maxima or minima or corresponding displacements is called the wavelength, which has usually denoted by the Greek letter lambda, and I'll use capital L, uh, not having Greek typography accessible to me. Now, in addition to this picture, we want to know that light, electromagnetic radiation, is also a wave. The red lines depict the magnitude of the electric field vector of radiation, and the blue lines the magnetic field, and you see they're at right angles to each other. And the wave moves forward as shown in the diagram. Now let me say a few more words about electromagnetic radiation. What we call light is the visible region of this radiation. It has a wavelength which is, corresponds to the dimensions shown here, roughly the size of protozoans. Radio waves, which are also emitted by stars and which we use ourselves, have a much longer wavelength, about a thousand meters, and correspond to buildings. And so do we go down to the very shortest wavelengths, gamma rays, which have wavelengths of the size of atomic nuclei. And all these are observed in the spectra from other uh, stars and galaxies. Now, there's another point, which I'll come to later, that if you th think of a, a body at a certain temperature, it will emit radiation. And the amount of radiation that it's emitting, its maximum, corresponds to certain wavelengths, depending on how hot it is. And this gave rise, in fact, to the beginnings of quantum mechanics. We talk about history. My wife, again, in her wisdom, said, if you want to understand something, the best way to understand it is to look at its history. And that's what we're going to do here. Now, at the end of the 19th century, physicists thought they had everything explained. They had electromagnetic radiation explained with Maxwell's equations. But there were still things that were mysterious. There was what was called the ultraviolet catastrophe, in which if you calculated what the radiation emitted from bodies at uh, given temperatures, then as the wavelength got shorter and shorter, that is, as the radiation moved to the ultraviolet from the visible, the amount of radiation increased and then increased into an infinite way. And this was a mystery. It didn't happen. This wasn't how nature behaved, but this is what the theory, classical physics, predicted. Now, Max Planck solved this problem, and he solved it by quantizing energy. And this was in 1900. He said that light could be transferred in quantum packets, and the energy of a packet of radiant energy was given by a constant named after him, Planck's constant times the frequency f. And if you use the relationship between frequency, speed, velo wave velocity, and length, that translates to h, c, c is the speed of light, l is the length. If you look at the pictures here, you see the results of this, how radiation, here's molten steel about 1600 degrees Kelvin, very hot, and it is showing white light. Now that's toward the blue. It's a mixture of red and blue, but it's very hot. If you have the temperature, make it only 800 degrees Kelvin, and you look at fireplace embers, then they are showing red. 
the wavelength increases as the temperature decreases. Okay, let's go to the next bit of history. Now, we've gotten energy is transferred as a packet of energy. In his marvelous year, 1905, in which he gave the special theory of relativity and explained Brownian motion, Einstein also explained the photoelectric effect, and this indeed was what he got the Nobel Prize for. He said that light acts not only like a wave, but like particles, which he called photons. The energy of a photon is given by, again, Planck's constant, a very, very small number times the frequency of the radiation. And here's a picture. A photon hits a metal. If the energy is sufficient to tear the electron away from the binding nucleus in the metal, it will be ejected. If there's excess energy, it will increase the kinetic energy of the ejected electron and uh, the velocity will be greater. You see this in the picture here. In the red, the 700 nanometers is a long wavelength. It doesn't have enough energy. The frequency is too low to eject electrons. No matter how much of this radiation you put on the metal, no electrons would be ejected. The green wave at 550 nanometers has sufficient energy and a little bit more to eject electrons and they come off with a speed of about 3 times 10 to the 5th meters per second. You increase the uh, energy of the photons to fo by decreasing the wavelength down to 400 nanometers, and the velocity of the ejected electrons is even greater. This is the photoelectric effect. Now, more history. If waves act like particles, Perhaps particles can act like waves. And the French physicist de Broglie, Count de Broglie, in 1924 proposed that particles can do this. He proposed their wavelength, L, is given by Planck's constant over the momentum. The momentum is simply the product of the mass of the electron or the particle and its velocity. And again, H is Planck's. Now, this is a marvelous prediction, but as in all science, science is not only theory, it's experiment. You have to have confirmation, experimental confirmation of a theory. So here's a picture of the experiment conducted by Davison and Germer in which the de Broglie hypothesis was uh, confirmed. You have a picture of a unit cell that's the little cube there of the balls with a ball B right in the middle plane. The top layer of light hits and is reflected like a wave. That's the top the electron at the top. At the bottom, the other green layer, there's a difference of one wavelength in the path it travels. So when the top green and the bottom green mix, they reinforce each other. Plus, plus, plus gives twice the amount. Now in the middle, the red arrow only goes a half a wavelength. So that wave is down when the top wave is up or the bottom wave is up. So they interfere. So you see a diffraction pattern and it's related to the angle at which the electrons are hitting their speed, and so forth. And all this is confirmed so that the part, the electrons are acting like waves. Now, one more piece of history. And this is the English physicist Dirac. And he introduced, he did a number of other things in physics, but uh, I'm going to focus on his representation of quantum mechanics by what are called vectors and the vector state formalism. When I looked this up on the web, it said 1939. I don't think that number is right. That's when his book possibly on quantum mechanics came out, but I, it was certainly much earlier. But I, the quantum states that you can have are represented as a combination of independent states, basis. And the reason it's called a vector state is just as a vector can be represented as components along three perpendicular axes, 
so can the quantum state be represented as components along, well, many other axes, but all being thought of as perpendicular to each other. Now, here's a unreal example. You can give examples from physics, but they don't really mean much if you're not a physicist. So what we're going to think about in this very artificial example is voting, a husband and a wife voting. And in the picture, you see the little lady with the red hat. She's voting Republican. And the man with the blue cap, he's voting Democrat. And so here are the possible states. The wife Democratic, the husband Democratic, the wife Republican, the hu husband Republican, the wife Democratic, the husband Republican, and the wife Republican, and the husband Democratic. And we put a number one half in front of this, weighting each of these component states by a factor of one half. And for what I have, as I have written it here, this would mean that the probability, if you actually did the voting, i.e. a measurement, the probability would be one half squared for any of those component states. So what we have again is a bar inside stuff, parameters that describe the state, and then a little arrow. And there's the conjugate, a bra, which is the same thing. And I'm not going to go what the relation between bra and cat is. It's like a uh, number in the complex conjugate imaginary of the number. But that's getting too deep. Now, I want to interject something else here. This is a very famous physicist, picture Richard Feynman. Uh, he came to Caltech my last year at Caltech, and I sat in on his quantum mechanics class. And he is famous for making the statement that if anybody tells you they understand quantum mechanics, they're a liar, which uh, is true in an intuitive sense. Quantum mechanics violates our intuitive notion of how things should go. But here's an act, that, 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 that quote is apocryphal. It's been attributed to him, but you can't really source it when you look it up. But this is a quote that is sourced. It's a book he wrote about quantum electrodynamics for which he won the Nobel Prize. And it's what he told students at the beginning of the class. What I'm going to tell you about quantum electric, and he said quantum mechanics in his course, is what we teach our physics students in the third or fourth year of graduate school. It is my task to convince you not to turn away because you don't understand it. You see, my physics students don't understand it. That is because I don't understand it. Nobody does. So if you don't think you, if you think you don't understand quantum mechanics, you're in very good company. Now, let me go now to talking about some of the mysteries of quantum mechanics. And I'm going to look at the uh, most famous experiment, or the most experiment that really says all there is to say about quantum mechanics. This is what Feynman used in his introductory lecture to try to tell people how quantum mechanics works. And it's the experiment of diffraction. And this is one of the reasons I want you to learn of know a little bit about waves. If a wave front goes through a small hole or slit, it bends, as in this bottom left-hand picture. As you see, it gets curves. The green lines are maxima. The black lines are minima of the wave. So it becomes a circle from a plane. It just bends around the corner. Now, if you have two holes or slits, if one of those waves is positive and the other is negative, they will cancel out giving you zero. If they are the, both positive, they will add up to give you a maximum. If they are both negative, they will add, add up in an algebraic sense to give you a minimum. Here's a picture of that. And the blue lines radiating out are where the waves are interfering and canceling out. Now, if we apply, if we say that uh, particles are act like waves, 
then they will show this behavior going through a double slit. In classical physics, if you had a BB gun or shotgun and shot it through a slit with two holes, you'd see them line up, turning the screen over in sort of two lines. There'd be a little bit of scatter as they moved, weren't quite going through the holes. But this is, but if you do a experiment with really tiny BB guns, i.e. light particles or electrons, then they won't show that you'll see a different pattern. Now, it won't be that a, one particle will spread out. The first particle might land at the bottom here, the next particle up here, another one here. But after you had shot a great many through, they would show a the same diffraction pattern that you would see with a wave. So this is the double split experiment that illustrates the wave-like behavior of particles. Now, there is something very strange about this. Because if you try to actually measure, go to the slits and observe which particle goes through which slit, you'll disturb them and they will act like particles, no longer act like waves. If, if you close one slit, then it will behave in a classical way. It will no longer interfere. Now, the great American physicist, John Wheeler, did the following thought experiment. And he did it first, he conceived of it as light coming from a distant galaxy, bending around a heavy star, and then combining with uh, telescopes. And if you move, you have the screen on looking at the left hand, you have the screen on which the particles are coming from the double slit experiment, photons in this case. Now you remove the screen and observe it with two telescopes that are placed far enough apart that the two rays of light coming through the two slits are not far enough apart that they aren't can't possibly interfere with each other. And you'll see it behave just like it would be classically. But now if you do this after the particles have gone through the slit, then they will, in fact, behave classically. And this is the question. This is the strange part. How do the particles, after they've gone through the slit, know that you have removed the slit? This is sort of a mystery, the delayed double slit experiment. Now, let me go. I haven't explained this. There are a number of explanations. There are a number of uh, ways of talking about it, but I'm not, we don't really have time to do that. And I want to talk about one more quantum mystery, which illustrates both the superposition and the entanglement aspects. Let's consider we have a state, and I'll choose a uh, quantum state in which it's a happy marriage and the husband and wife vote in the same way. Uh, I've heard of marriages in which they're on opposite sides of the fence, but uh, I'm not sure how long that could endure, particularly in these times, but we'll not go political at this point. So e e either the, both the husband and wife vote Republican, that is, both have blue headgear, or the husband and wife both vote Democratic and have blue headgear. Now, a measurement is the vo act of voting what uh, Dr. Lagerlund will, in his talk, call the R process. And you'll notice that uh, the vector state now is no longer a combination. It's either a husband and wife with both red headgear or a husband and wife with both blue headgear. So that the act of measurement has effectively wiped out one or the other of the two states that are in the combination. The vector state, so to speak, has collapsed. And this is a mystery, what is happening here. There are various explanations, I won't go into it, but it isn't really in the mathematics. It's a, an extra mathematical apparatus, a projection state operator is introduced 
to account for this. So people are not always happy with this, and there are a number of ways of trying to explain it, which I won't try to explain here. So you see, now, here's the entanglement part. The husband and wife will be voting the same way if this entanglement occurs, not only if they vote in the same voting polling place, but this will happen if the husband votes in Massachusetts and the wife votes in California and they vote at the same time. They are entangled, and that would be a mystery. So that these properties are, in fact, linked, and they're linked over a long distance, and they're linked by we know not what, by interactions that are supposedly faster than the speed of light. And that brings us to the next slide. Uh, a Irish physicist, John Bell, uh, and I hope you like that qu quote, I am a quantum engineer, but on Sundays I have principles, uh, proposed the following theorem. He, like Einstein, was unhappy with what is called spooky action at a distance, that is, this entanglement. And a number of explanations using what are called hidden variables, variables that we don't understand or see that create the quantum phenomena uh, might be holding. So his theorem assumes that there are such hidden variables that interact locally or by forces transmitted at light speed. And he predicts that there will be certain patterns of measurement if you separate the particles of an entangled pair. The measurements will be co correlated in a particular way even when the particles are separated. Now, again, there's interplay in science and physics between theory and, uh, fit and uh, experiment. And experiments done by Clauser and Aspet, and there were some others whose name I forget, show that the Bell's theorem was violated. So we can draw several conclusions. I'll only list a few of these. The first conclusion is that reality, in quotation marks, whatever you mean by that, is non-local. That is, there's sort of a, un a connection, a reality that connects these particles, even though they're separated by galaxies, light years. This is the spooky action at the distance, the faster than light interaction that bothered Einstein. The conclusion, too, is that maybe some other kind of reality occurs, what the French physicist philosopher Despinat called veiled reality that we don't really understand, but that is there. God understands it, but our minds aren't maybe good enough to do that. The, th the third conclusion is that the exper experiment doesn't have free will to choose the experiment settings, uh, which is called super, de de super de determinism. And there are some others which advance that particles uh, can send messages into the future and have a sort of transaction with what might be in the future. Well, I'll only say that uh, the Nobel Prize in 2022 was given to uh, Clauser and Aspect for, and Zellinger for their work in showing that Bell's theorem was violated. Here's a rough picture, very di diagrammatic. There's a source. One of the entangled par par particles goes to a measurement and I know physicists always call the two different things Bob and Alice. I'm not sure where that comes from. There must be a movie or something that they're thinking about. But anyhow, one goes there, one goes there. And they are using photons. The photons are bounced, bounced off, which is the equivalent of removing the uh, screen. And they measure coincidences, and they see where their coincidences of measurement. They aren't what uh, are predicted. Very nice, very tricky, very lovely experiment. Well, let me go to the wind-up. There are various theological interpretations or intersections that you can draw with quantum mechanics. I talk about this in 
greater length in my book. The first is that uh, quantum mechanics and theology are totally independent. There's no overlap. One is physics, one is theology. That's it. The other is that uh, you should be able to give some theological positions making use of quantum mechanics, but quantum mechanics is really not all that under, well understood to be helpful. And that's the great physicist uh, Pokingharm, fellow of the Royal Society, who became an Anglican priest. The other is sort of midway, and that's my own uh, position, that you can do some constructive theology, although it's highly speculative. And I've listed the names of physicists and the theologians who take this stance. And uh, fourth, which is stronger, that modern physics yields strong theological conclusions. I'm not sure that's true. I think uh, faith comes first and physics second. And fifth, that uh, this is sort of the mystic, what I call the woo-woo uh, tradition, that uh, Asian religion, religious traditions, Buddhism, I'm not trying to insult anybody, and quantum mechanics conclusions converge to be regarded as a single entity. And uh, that fine physicist Bohm, who came up with the hidden variable theories, and uh, I don't know what Capra does, but he takes this off. And finally, I think what is really the best explanation, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, possibly uh, Dr. Lagerlund will say a few words, is that Aristotelian and Thomistic philosophy fully explains quantum mysteries. And there are a whole bunch of people in the last five or six years who've taken this position. And with that, I conclude, and I hope this gives rise to a few stirrings of understanding, if not complete. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Curlin, for that very fascinating presentation. And now I'm pleased to introduce our second presenter. Dr. Terence Lagerland has been a neurologist in the Division of Epilepsy at Mayo Clinic for 35 years, treating patients with epilepsy and interpreting their electroencephalograms. He also lectures to residents and fellows on electroencephalography including basic principles of electricity and neurophysiology. He has published papers and authored book chapters on electroencephalography and epilepsy, particularly regarding quantitative analysis of electroencephalograms. Prior to becoming a neurologist, he obtained a PhD in physics and worked as a postdoctoral research associate at the MIT Laboratory for Nuclear Science, doing research at Brookhaven National Laboratory in CERN as a term physicist at Fermilab. So uh, that is an impressive curriculum vitae. Dr. Lagerlin's presentation is entitled, Bridging the Chasm, How Quantum Mechanics Brings Together the Physical and Spiritual Worlds. Dr. Lagerlin, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mahfoud, and uh, thank you, Dr. Curlin, for uh, preparing things so well by explaining uh, the basics of quantum mechanics. Uh, so uh, I'm going to take mostly viewpoint number six on uh, Dr. Curlin's last slide that the Aristotelian and uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, viewpoints can help to explain the mysteries of quantum mechanics. But let me just say one thing. Uh, sometimes I think God is uh, thumbing his nose at the uh, philosophers and theologians who say, uh, that even God can't do what is logically impossible. He can't make a square circle or a circle square. But on the other hand, God has made quantum mechanics where particles and waves can can be the same thing, even though they're mutually exclusive. So, <laughs> so that's something to think about. So I'm going to start my slideshow here. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is how classical determinism, that is classical uh, physics, conflicts with uh, religion. And then we'll talk about uh, how quantum mechanics introduces indeterminacy. We'll talk about various interpretations of quantum mechanics. And uh, then we'll talk about Wolfgang Smith's interpretation, which uh, uh, everything that I have to say afterwards will be based on that interpretation. 
We'll also talk about deterministic chaos in classical systems and the interaction of chaos and quantum indeterminacy. And then we'll talk about how God might govern the universe, uh, divine providence, using the analogy of a game, uh, like a board game. And we'll talk about how human free will fits in. So a number of things we are going to talk about here. So let's start out by asking a basic question. What determines what happens in the physical world? What are the causes of what happens? And people over the years have uh, certainly come up with various possible answers. The Stoics, for example, said that everything is determined by fate. Um, many peoples have assumed that the will of the gods or supernatural beings determines what happens. Um, most of the time, people recognize that we humans have uh, a freedom to act and to choose, uh, and that also determines to some degree what happens. And some have also suggested that what happens is determined by random chance. Now, in Judeo-Christian beliefs, uh, it's clear from reading the Bible that God is the Lord of the physical universe and is absolutely sovereign. He perpetually determines what happens in the world by his free choices. But also humans can, uh, can choose freely what they do. And perhaps some things also happen by random chance. And Thomas Aquinas also points out that the will of God often acts through secondary causes. Now, along came modern science, which was developed in the 17th centuries and following and continued up to the early 20th century. Uh, and these are the principles discovered by Galileo and Newton and Laplace and so on, uh, classical mechanics, gravity, electromagnetism, uh, which Dr. Kurland uh, talked some about. And according to uh, the scientific view, if you know the laws of nature, these precise mathematical equations, and the initial conditions, what happens next is uniquely determined. By initial conditions, I mean... If you know everything there is about your, your system uh, at a particular point in time, like the positions and velocities and angular velocities or spins of all of the components of the system, if you know that exactly, then the equations of physics will tell you exactly what those positions, velocities, angular velocities, and so on are going to be at the next moment in time. And then you can continue to predict the entire future uh, and it's uniquely determined. There's no, no randomness uh, in what happens. So one way of saying that is that the entire universe is a complete and closed system of cause and effect, which is called the principle of causal closure. Now, if you think about this, that means there's really no room for God to act in the universe. Uh, if you're going to think of God at all, you think of him as a creator only, uh, called the deist view. In addition, there's no room for human free will. If everything's determined by these mathematical laws, we can't have any uh, freedom to, to determine what happens. And also, there's nothing random, nothing left to chance. So the result is really a conflict between science and religion, because God can't change what happens in the physical world, except, of course, if he were to override the laws of nature, disobey these laws, as it were, which we might call a miracle. But most people, even uh, religious people, think that miracles are fairly few and far between. We don't like to think about God continuously performing miracles minute by minute uh, in order to make the universe do what he wants it to do. So basically, other than miracles, God can't change what happens. And this led to the philosophy of deism, namely that a supreme intelligence may have created the universe, but then uh, no longer interfered at all with its operation. Like a mechanical device, the universe follows its deterministic course according to precise mathematical laws that we describe as laws of cause and effect. Whatever happens now causes what happens next, which causes what happens next, and so on. So this is sort of a modern version of Stoic philosophy that everything is already determined by fate, as it were. According to this principle of causal closure, God, even if he exists, is irrelevant to our lives. He can't answer prayers. He can't change anything or do anything. Similarly, our spirits or souls, even if they exist, are irrelevant to what we believe or say or do. 
because physical determinism says that the entire physical world, including our brains and bodies, is under the complete control of the laws of physics. It's all determined by what happened uh, previously, and uh, it determines exactly what's going to happen next. So there's no way for a spiritual world, even if it exists, to influence what happens in the physical world. So this is the conflict that we have. There's no way for the spiritual world to connect with the physical world. That is, until the 1920s when quantum mechanics was fully developed. And this brought about the end of physical determinism. Stephen Barr, a physicist, uh, uh, made this statement, and I quote from him because he says it very well. Just as many people were concluding that science compels a belief in physical determinism, the science itself was beginning to change. 300 years after Newton's death, physics underwent a profound transformation with the development of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was not just a theory of some particular class of physical phenomena, it was a new conceptual foundation for all of physics, and this new foundation was radically non-deterministic. So Dr. Kurland has already talked about some of the principles of quantum mechanics, uh, but let me just emphasize uh, the idea of the state vector, which he already kind of started describing there with, uh, it's uh, written out mathematically using that bra and ket notation uh, that uh, he talked about. But the basic idea is that in quantum mechanics, the properties of objects like the positions of the particles, the velocity, the spin, the energy, and so on, are not known. They're indeterminate until someone observes the system or measures the system. Rather, a state vector encapsulates all that can be known about an object. And this state vector represents a combination called a superposition of all possible mutually exclusive states. For example, you would have to have an element in that state vector for each possible position in space that the quantum object could be in. Or uh, if you're talking about velocities or momenta, there would be an element in the state vector for each possible velocity or momentum. Uh, in addition to having an element in the state vector for each possibility, uh, the numeric value of that state vector uh, gives you a specific probability that the quantum object will be in that particular position or have that particular velocity or whatever. So what the state vector really describes is not where the particle is or how it's moving, but where it might be or how it might be moving. In other words, the potential states of the object. Uh, in the example that Dr. Curlin gave, that would be the possibility of whether the husband and the wife vote Republican or Democratic, and each one would be associated with a particular probability. Now, we're familiar with this if you've taken any basic science courses like chemistry in the idea of uh, uh, the atomic structure. An atom is made up of a very tiny nucleus, whose dimension is about one Fermi, uh, and it's surrounded by a bunch of electrons. In the hydrogen atom, there's just one electron, and yet we don't know where that electron is. All we can say is that there's a certain probability of it being here or there, and that's represented by this so-called electron cloud where the darkness or the density of these dark dots represents the relative probability of finding the electron here or there or somewhere else. So this tells us that the electron's most probably near the nucleus, but it could be way out here or even way out here. And we just don't know where it is until we observe or make a measurement. So that leads to the two processes involved in quantum mechanics called the U and the R process. The U process says that in response to forces acting on the object, the state vector, that is this collection of probabilities of potential outcomes, evolves over time. That is, the, these probabilities change over time. And that change in probabilities is very deterministic. It's determined by a precise mathematical equation called the Schrodinger equation. And the, uh, the uh, state vector of all these different probabilities uh, forms what's called a linear superposition of multiple mutually exclusive potential states. Then comes the R process. The R process is what happens when you make an observation. 
When you make an observation, you always find the object to be in a definite state. Only one of the potential outcomes chosen at random is true. When the object is observed, for example, when its position is measured, random chance determines which particular result is found according to Born's probability law. At the instant that the object is observed, the state vector collapses, or that is, is reduced to a new state vector, which consists of just one actual state out of all the mutually exclusive possible states. Future evolution of the state vector is based on the state the object was discovered to be in after observation. So to summarize, the U process generates possible states. The R process of measurement or observation selects one of those states and then all of the other possible states disappear. The new collapse state vector encapsulates a new set of probabilities. Specifically, it tells us that there's a 100% chance of getting the result actually observed and a 0% chance of getting any of the other potential results. So for example, when you're playing dice, you, uh, when you first throw the dice, you have a one-sixth chance of getting a one, one-sixth chance of getting a two, and so on. That's like the U process would tell you that before you make the measurement or observation. Once you throw the dice, of course, you get a particular result, uh, and the chance of having any other result is becomes zero because you know what the result was. So that's kind of what we're talking about, the collapse of the state vector, collapse of this superposition of various possible states. So to reiterate, the state vector determines only the probability of a specific measurement result. The actual result is randomly chosen. After the observation has been made, the new reduced or collapsed state vector now continues to evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. So over time, the state vector again becomes a superposition of multiple possible states until another observation or measurement is made. So the Schrodinger equation sort of loads the dice, that is, determines the probabilities of one or the other outcome. The observation or measurement throws the dice and thereby collapses the state vector. So that's the way quantum mechanics works. Uh, I can kind of diagram that here in the particular case of measuring the position of a particle. The same kind of thing could be said about measuring its velocity or any other measurable properties. So we'll assume here that in the beginning, we've just made a measurement and we know exactly where that particle is. This is the position of the particle versus time. So in the beginning, we know the particles here. So the probability distribution in the state vector is what we call a delta function. It says basically the particles just here and nowhere else. But over time, due to the U process, that probability distribution kind of expands. And now we don't know exactly where the particle is. Or over time, we know maybe less and less about where the particle is. And by the way, these bell curves are just by example. In, in actual practice, the probability distribution is not a bell curve, but it's some uh, strange function uh, that's determined by the Schrodinger equation. Then along comes another measurement, and then the R process is invoked, which selects one possible position out of this probability distribution of positions, and that collapses the state vector. So now we're back to a delta function. We know exactly where that particle is. And then over time, the U process, the Schrodinger equation says, again, the, we become uncertain about where the particle is. The probability distribution spreads out until you make another measurement. And then we know exactly where it is and so on. So that's the way systems uh, evolve in quantum mechanics. Now, Einstein himself hated this idea. He made the famous statement, God does not throw dice. He meant by that that quantum mechanics is incomplete. That is, that random chance uh, should not determine what happens, but uh, random chance, um, in fact, does determine what happens. Uh, that's what physics is telling us. Now, one can make a philosophical interpretation of this based on Aristotelian uh, ideas of um, how systems can exist in a potential state and then be actualized. Uh, that was suggested by the physicist Werner Heisenberg a long time ago, but recently Kastner and others have, have taken up this idea and written a paper about it. They say, an appropriate realist understanding of quantum mechanics calls for the metaphysical category of res potentia, that is possible things, 
just as Heisenberg suggested long ago. In particular, we suggest a non-substance dualism of res potentia and res extentia as mutually implicative modes of existence where quantum states instantiate a particular quantifiable form of res potentia, which uh, Kastner et al. call quantum potentia or QP. So they argue uh, that measurement is a real physical process that transforms quantum potentiae into elements of res extensa in a non-unitary and classically a-causal process. In other words, it transforms possible things into extended things, that is, space-time events. So in this ontology, space-time, the structured set of actuals, emerges from a quantum substratum as actuals crystallizing out of a more fluid domain of possibles. Thus, space-time is not all that exists. However, Kastner et al. do point out that space-time events are the only thing that are accessible to our senses. We don't see quantum potentiae. We don't see uh, superpositions. We only see uh, the actuals that crystallize out of that more fluid domain of possibles. So this then is the post-1920s scientific view. The laws of nature, specifically the Schrodinger equation and the initial conditions of the system uh, evolve over time. The system evolves over time by the U process, but generating what are called quantum potentia, that is the set of all possible outcomes of observations. Then when an observation occurs called the R process that forces a choice of one particular outcome that state vector or quantum potential collapses and basically random chance determines which of the outcomes chosen from that probability distribution that we call the quantum potential. So what happens is no longer uniquely determined. So this is the end of physical determinism uh, that comes from quantum mechanics. Now we'll talk about the various interpretations of quantum mechanics. What we've been describing is called the Copenhagen interpretation, which postulates that observation collapses the state vector. But the question is, why does it? Why should observing an object that is measuring something instantaneously collapse its state vector, while all other interactions with external physical systems and forces do not do so? In other words, we can have some atoms interacting with other atoms or some at atoms interacting with some other physical system. That doesn't collapse the state vector. But somehow, when somebody makes a measurement, when somebody observes the object, that does collapse the state vector. So the measurement problem in quantum mechanics is the problem of when, how, and why state vector collapse, the R process occurs. The inability of quantum mechanics to explain this process has given rise to various alternative interpretations of quantum mechanics. Now, I should point out that the alternative interpretations don't change the actual mathematics of quantum mechanics. Uh, they don't change the results. They don't change the probabilities. What they do is they simply are different ways of interpreting what happens when a state vector collapses. Now, Schrodinger himself was aware that there's something odd about quantum mechanics and these superpositions, and he uh, invented this famous thought experiment. The idea, I quote here exactly his words, but to summarize, he, is, he basically assumed that, uh, uh, or postulated in this thought experiment, that a cat would be put in a steel box, and in that steel box there's also a bit of radioactive material and a Geiger counter that can detect the radiation from that material. Uh, he assumed that it would be a very small amount of radioactive material, so the probability of a decay occurring over the course of an entire hour would only be 50-50, 50% chance. So the laws of quantum mechanics don't tell us for sure whether the atom will decay or not. They ba basically just tell us that there's a 50% probability that it will decay sometime within that hour, or a 50% chance that it won't. Now, if a decay occurs, it triggers a relay, which drops a hammer that shatters a flask of poisonous hyocyanic acid, thereby killing the poor cat. Again, this is a thought experiment. Don't try this at home. So the idea is then the state vector of the entire system would express this by having it in the living and dead cat superimposed, that is mixed or smeared out in equal parts until the hour goes by and the chamber is opened and the cat is observed. Now, of course, one never observes uh, a 50% uh, 
live 50% dead cat. And Kastner et al. would say that happens because our senses are only capable of perceiving the results of state vector collapse, which is res extensa, not the realm of res potentia, the possible outcomes. But the question still remains, when does the state vector collapse? According to the Copenhagen interpretation, until you actually open the box and make an observation, the state vector hasn't collapsed. But that doesn't make a lot of sense. Common sense would tell us that the cat's either going to die or, or live uh, when the atom either decays or doesn't decay. So does the state vector collapse even before a human opens the chamber and observes the cat? But if so, why does it if there was no observation? So that's kind of a problem. So Wigner and von Neumann, uh, two famous physicists, uh, came up with their own interpretation. They postulated that a conscious observer is necessary to trigger state vector collapse in the quantum mechanical measurement process. An inert material device used for measurement, like a Geiger counter or other instrument, cannot cause state vector to collapse. The state of the system remains in that superposition of all possible states. The total system of atom plus Geiger counter uh, is simply a larger indeterminate system that exists as a superposition of possible states. However, they said, an observer's consciousness must be in either one state or the other, Hence, conscious observations are different from all other physical processes or interactions that occur. Now, there's some problems with this interpretation also. For example, how is a conscious observer defined, physically speaking? Do we assume that cats are conscious and are able to collapse a state vector? What about other animals? Can an ant collapse a state vector? And what about a paramecium and so on? <laughs> So if conscious observers are necessary to collapse the state vector of any quantum system by making a measurement or observation, then what about all the quantum processes that occur elsewhere in the vast universe where no living conscious beings are around to decide how and whether to observe these processes? Think, for example, of the interiors of stars or hot Jupiter planets, locations in the universe where we would really not expect to find a conscious living creature, for example. Remember that the U process only generates potential states of quantum system and their probabilities. If the R process observation never occurs, what meaning would these predicted probabilities of the outcomes of an observation have? Uh, in other words, do the state vectors of never observed systems remain uncollapsed for all time, leaving most of the entire universe in some shadowy state of quantum uncertainty and unreality? Well, most physicists wouldn't buy that assumption either. We, we tend to think that quantum processes occur in the interiors of stars or on hot Jupiter planets. And even though there's no creatures around to observe them, still there's a definite result that eventually happens. Another problem with Wigner's interpretation is that many scientists believe that conscious awareness and decision-making arises from the activity of neuronal networks in the brain. Yet brains are physical, and they're governed by the same laws as other physical systems, so why shouldn't the neuronal networks of the brain of the experimenter also exist in a superposition of two or more mutually incompatible states corresponding to the possible results of the measurement, along with the measurement apparatus and the quantum system being measured? But if that were so, what would it mean for one's consciousness and knowledge to be at a specific time in multiple mutually incompatible states? So these are all the paradoxes or mysteries that come about from trying to understand the measurement problem. Well, another interpretation of quantum mechanics is called the many worlds interpretation. This is due to Hugh Everett III. And now things get really rather bizarre, I would say. According to this interpretation, the laws of nature, the Schrodinger equation, and the initial conditions lead to evolution of the state vector, which are the possible outcomes of observation, and then the R process, when an observation occurs, the universe splits into multiple branches called a multiverse. All possible outcomes of the observation occur, but each one of them occurs in a different branch universe. In addition, this gets really bizarre, all conscious beings like you and I end up being duplicated in all of these branch universes of the multiverse. So what we observe, what happens, differs depending on which particular universe 
one particular copy of us happens to be in. So a copy of me might be in a universe that observes one result. Another copy of me is in a different universe, which observed a different result and so on. So this is the multiple worlds interpretation. Um, now, besides being rather bizarre, uh, there's no way to prove this since uh, Hugh Everett said that once the universe splits, each branch universe can have no causal contact with any of the other parallel universes. So this idea will never be verifiable experimentally, despite lots of uh, science fiction stories and, and movies about the multiverse. Uh, uh, according to uh, this theory, there's no way to move from one branch to another branch. So it remains a speculative idea. Furthermore, this doesn't explain the measurement problem, really. What causes the universe to split at the time of an observation? Again, you've got the same problem. What's special about an observation? Is a conscious observer necessary to split the universe? So if we don't want to believe in splitting universes and we don't want to consider conscious observers, what are we left with? In the end, what determines the particular outcome of an observation? Is there a cause within the physical world of state vector collapse? Or is state vector collapse at the time of a measurement basically an uncaused event? We can't explain it. We don't know why it happens. We seem to be forced to conclude that state vector collapse is truly an uncaused process with a random result, thus breaking the chain of cause and effect in the physical world. Well, one can see why Einstein thought that something was missing in quantum mechanics. So now I'm going to talk about Wolfgang Smith's interpretation. Wolfgang Smith is a, a modern physicist uh, who wrote a book uh, called The Quantum Enigma. And in this book, he postulated a new cause of state vector collapse. He said that the most fundamental equation of physics, the Schrodinger equation, describes not space-time reality, but merely the behavior of quantum potentiae, mutually exclusive potential realities, and the U process, the evolution of these quantum potentiae or state vectors, represents horizontal causation. He then has this profound insight that only God can bring about an ontological change, a change in being, from the realm of res potentia to the realm of res extensa. So he says, God causes state vector collapse. God uses the R process to select one particular reality from all the sub-existential potential realities generated by the U process as time unfolds. This R process he calls vertical causation and is a cosmogenic, that is, reality-creating process. Thus, in this view, God is the universal observer of quantum processes. So this kind of solves the measurement process. We don't need any other observers because there's God. In this way, God continually acts within the physical world. And I recently came across this little limerick, uh, which uh, uh, I'll let you read here. There once was a man who said, God must think it exceedingly odd if he finds that this tree continues to be when there's no one about in the quad. Dear sir, your astonishment's odd, I am always about in the quad, and that's why the tree will continue to be, since observed by, yours faithfully, God. And this is from Father Ronald Arbuthnot Knox, who was a chaplain at uh, Oxford University. All right, so now we've solved the measurement problem, perhaps. Let's reinterpret the uh, Schrodinger cat thought experiment now. Uh, so the Schrodinger cat experiment reinterpreted horizontal causation, which is the U process, is limited by the most fundamental physical theory, quantum mechanics, to the sub-existential plane of quantum potentiae, that is, superpositions of quantum states, and God's reality-creating act, which we call vertical causation, which is an aspect of Ar uh, Aristotle's and, and Thomas Aquinas' primary causation, is required for a real space-time event to crystallize out of the multiple potential space-time events superimposed in one state vector. So basically, God determines when the atom decays uh, and whether the cat is alive or dead, and that's what we call uh, vertical causation. So secondary causation that Aristotle talks about is the same as horizontal causation that Smith talks about, and basically it determines possibilities 
whereas vertical causation determines what becomes real. All right, let's try to run with this idea and see what we can do with it. First question, does it matter that God causes state vector collapse in quantum processes? After all, quantum effects are not typically seen in the macro world, the world of our everyday experience. Is God only the Lord of the atomic realm? Well, in case you're wondering, the answer is no. So let's talk about why that is and how quantum effects can interact in the macro to uh, create effects in the macroscopic world. So we'll first talk about something called deterministic chaos. Chaos theory is a field of study in mathematics which studies the behavior of dynamical systems that are highly sensitive to their initial conditions. Remember we said in classical mechanics, the initial conditions and the equations of physics precisely determine the uh, future of that system. However, in a chaotic system, very small differences in the initial conditions yield widely diverging outcomes, rendering long-term prediction impossible. So even though the system is fully deterministic, we can't in practice predict the outcome over time because we just don't know the initial conditions in a, a sufficient degree of precision. So their future behavior is determined, no random elements are involved, but it's not predictable in practice. This theory was summarized by Edward Lorenz as follows. Deterministic chaos is when the present determines the future, but the approximate present does not approximately determine the future. So in a non-chaotic system, if we're a little off in measuring our initial conditions, we can still predict the system pretty well. We'll just be a little bit off in predicting what happens. In a chaotic system, if we're a little bit off in measuring the initial conditions, we'll be totally wrong about predicting the future. And it turns out that many natural systems do uh, show chaotic behavior. Earth's atmosphere is a typical example because we can never know all the initial conditions of a complex system like the atmosphere in sufficient or perfect detail. We cannot hope to predict the ultimate fate of such a complex system. Even slight errors in measuring the state of a system will be amplified dramatically, rendering any prediction useless. The butterfly effect says that very small changes in the initial conditions lead to drastic changes in the eventual results. Thus, for example, a butterfly flapping its wings in New Mexico eventually could cause a hurricane in China. It may take a very long time, we're talking about weeks or months, but the connection is real. If the butterfly had not flapped its wings at just the right point in space and time, the hurricane would not have happened. That's because the entire atmosphere is a connected deterministic system, which is also chaotic. Since it's impossible to measure the effects of all the butterflies, etc., in the world, accurate long-range weather prediction will always remain impossible. So let's look at a simpler example than the atmosphere that is chaotic. This is called the chaotic pendulum, where we have one mass suspended by a lever arm from a fixed surface, and a second mass is suspended from a lever arm from the first mass. We'll assume for simplicity that the motion is restricted to the moving in the plane, the motion of both masses is determined by Newton's laws and could be, in principle, exactly predicted if we knew exactly the initial position of the masses. However, the motion has extreme sensitivity to those initial positions, so in practice, we can't predict the specific trajectory. And this is what the trajectories look like. Uh, you can see why it's called chaotic behavior. Now, there is an interaction between chaos and quantum indeterminacy that we'll explore here. Quantum effects at the atomic or molecular level, although tiny, can influence the evolution of a macroscopic chaotic system because a minuscule change in the initial conditions eventually leads to a totally different outcome for the macroscopic system. In this way, the behavior of chaotic systems in the macro world, for which classical physics applies, are actually subject to the random outcomes of quantum state vector collapse in the micro world of atoms and subatomic particles. So in this way, God's choices of outcome of state vector collapse indeed affect the behavior of the macro world. So let's uh, look at a specific example. Think of uh, uh, radioactive decay. This is a quantum process and it certainly does have macroscopic effects. Natural radiation sources can cause mutations in DNA leading to cancer or birth defects. 
also cosmic rays, which are high energy particles or radiation coming from outer space generated by quantum processes in stars or other astronomical objects may affect weather phenomena because it's been shown that cosmic rays can lead to cloud formation and cosmic rays can also uh, precipitate lightning strikes by ionizing the atmosphere. And because, as we said, uh, the atmosphere is a chaotic phenomena, certainly these quantum processes occurring in uh, the sun or neighboring stars and so on that cause particles to reach the Earth are going to influence Earth's weather uh, in a very significant fashion. Let's look at a specific thought experiment uh, about this connection, uh, the double pendulum with radioactive decay. Uranium-238 is an isotope that spontaneously decays by emitting an alpha particle. This decay is a quantum process, so the laws of nature only determine the probability that any atom will decay at a given time and the probability that the alpha particle will be emitted at any particular angle. Imagine now that we have a double pendulum in which the lower mass is composed over contains a substance that's radioactive. When one of those radioactive atoms decays, the momentum of the emitted alpha particle causes a minuscule recoil of the lower mass, thus changing the trajectory of the pendulum by a tiny amount. In a non-chaotic dynamical system, this very tiny effect would have a negligible effect on subsequent motion. However, because of the chaotic dynamics of the double pendulum, the alpha particle emission eventually causes the double pendulum to follow a completely different trajectory from the one it would have followed without alpha particle emission. So I can run a little simulation here to show you how that works. The idea is we're showing two double pendula here. In this simulation, the one on the left has no radioactive substance. The one on the right does have a radioactive substance. Both start out in the same initial position. So if we didn't have any radioactivity, their trajectories would be precisely the same for all time. However, each time an alpha particle is emitted in the pendulum on the right, uh, that will cause a change, a slight change in the dynamics of the system. And by the way, in this simulation, you can see the alpha particle emission because the pendulum momentarily turns red. So initially, both pendulums follow the same trajectory, as you see here. Over time, you'll begin to see, oop, it just turned red on the right. That was one alpha particle being emitted. Still hasn't had much effect. And then over time, uh, more alpha particles will be emitted. Oop, there was another one. Oops, there was another one, turned red. And eventually, the recoil of these alpha particles leads to a different trajectory, as you see here. And now the two trajectories are totally different. So even though those effects are very tiny, the momentum of the alpha particle is about 10 to the minus 15th power of the momentum of these masses, it still leads to an entirely different macroscopic effect. So that's how quantum indeterminacy can interact in the macro world through the process of chaotic dynamics. All right. But wait, what about the probabilities of the various possibilities determined by the Schrodinger equation? Does God have any freedom to choose the outcome if the probabilities are rigidly determined by physical law? Yes, the outcomes of state vector collapse only appear to be random in experiments, but God has carefully thrown the dice that were already loaded by the Schrodinger equation to get the specific outcome he wills. That is, God's will is the cause of the particular outcome in an individual instance. Nevertheless, God carefully preserves the probabilities of outcomes determined by quantum mechanics so that when looking at large ensemble of similar situations, the probabilities predicted by quantum mechanics are obtained. And it's after all these quantum mechanical probabilities that lead to the predictable uh, behavior of physical systems through the world. So God has to preserve those in order for the world to behave as he wants it to behave, as it were. Nevertheless, uh, he can bring about both reasonably probable events and occasional very improbable events at specific times and places, and yet preserve the laws of physics overall. So, a little sidetrack here. Is a miracle different from an improbable event? A miracle violates or overrides the laws of physics while an improbable event does not. Quantum mechanics, more than classical mechanics, allows the possibility of improbable events that don't violate physical laws. As Stephen Barr points out, 
In the classical case, a deviation from the behaviors predicted by the physical laws due to a non-physical influence would show up as a violation of those laws. The laws would say that an atom should move a certain way and it would move a different way. For reasons I've already indicated, it will never be possible to know if such violations of the laws of physics go on, but the idea that they do is, to many people, rather ugly and philosophically unsatisfying. On the other hand, in a quantum process, several alternative outcomes are truly allowed to happen by the laws of physics, and so a choice can be made without violation of physical law. So let me see if I can convince you that this could work. Uh, this is radioactive decay. Uh, with an improbable event thrown in. This is a so-called Monte Carlo simulation of atomic decay um, with a twist. The idea is we have a radioactive substance placed near a phosphorescent screen. The radioactive substance is divided into 1,184 separate parts or fractions. Uh, and in this simulation, each fraction has its own random number generator in the computer program with its own seed or starting value, which determines the sequence of random numbers, independent of the random number generators of each of the other fractions. So the way the Monte Carlo simulation works is it picks three random numbers for each of these fractions of radioactive substance at each time interval. The first random number is used to determine the chance of a decay in that fraction in that time interval. The second random number determines the polar angle of alpha emission, and the third one determines the azimuthal angle. Once we know those two angles, the simulation can track the alpha particle and see if it hits the screen. And if it does hit the screen, a brief flash of light is generated. Uh, so I should point out that the twist here is that the random number generator seeds for each fraction are pre-selected in such a way as to produce a very improbable event at the time 9.50 seconds from the start of the simulation. So let's watch this here uh, as it runs. What we can see on the screen is little dots of light appearing as radioactive substances randomly decay, and the random numbers determine the probability that the, will go in this direction or that direction, and it'll hit the screen here or there. Uh, and the very improbable event that will occur involves an alpha particle being emitted from every one of these 1,184 fractions simultaneously, along specific trajectories that produce a predetermined pattern on the screen. So I, as the programmer, decided what event I want to happen, and by picking the seeds of these random numbers, thereby picking the sequence of random numbers, I arranged that that improbable event will happen at a particular time. And in fact, the probability of this happening by chance is very small, 10 to the minus 7,276. If you look at the sequence of random numbers, if you look at the, uh, the the dots on the screen, oh, there's the improbable event happening at that particular time. Uh, so if you look at the sequence of random numbers and the dots on the screen, the distribution, if you look at the chi-squared values of the random numbers, if you look at the autocorrelation function of one random number with the next, Nothing shows up that is anywhere different from random behavior. You can't detect anything random here, anything other than random occurring. If you were a physicist doing an experiment on this quantum system, you wouldn't find any violation of the laws of nature, and yet that very improbable event occurred. So that's why I believe that God can pick the outcomes of state vector collapse in such a way as to produce very improbable events at certain times. All right, so this is then the religious scientific view. The laws of nature, quantum mechanics, and the initial conditions of the universe, which were determined by a very precise fine-tuning, as you heard about in an earlier uh, webinar this year, are all determined by God's will. And these things determine the quantum probabilities uh, through what Wolfgang Smith calls horizontal causation, that is, the laws of nature. Uh, but what actually happens is determined by collapse of the state vector when God uh, picks one particular outcome out of the whole set of possible outcomes and confers reality upon that particular outcome. And so what happens is always determined by God. So in this viewpoint, nothing's left to chance, nothing is random. God determines everything that happens. Now, this doesn't account for human free will, but 
I think I'll be giving another webinar where we show uh, more about that in terms of the brain, but we'll also talk more about human free will a little bit later here. So God is sovereign over his creation. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. Now let's uh, run with this and have a little fun here. Uh, think of providence as being like a game that God plays in order to win a victory, as it were, a victory over sin. We'll call this the universe game. So let's talk about game theory for checkers. Checkers is played on an 8 by 8 checkered board with 24 pieces, which leads to 10 to the 20th different possible board positions. Uh, the game of checkers has been pronounced dead. This game was killed by the publication of a mathematical proof showing that checkers always result in a draw when neither player makes a mistake. Jonathan Schaefer did this proof, and it took him 18 years of running his computer program to complete. The crucial part of his computer proof involved playing out every possible end game involving fewer than 10 remaining pieces. And it turned out there were 39 trillion different possible ways the game could end, even starting with only 10 remaining pieces. And every one of those possibilities was a draw. Now let's talk about game theory for the universe. The universe, of course, started, we think, with the Big Bang and the space occupied by the universe, which we can think of as the playing board, has been expanding ever since. And the fundamental game pieces in the universe game would be the fundamental particles of nature, like matter, matter particles, like quarks that make up protons and neutrons, and leptons, like electrons and neutrinos, and also energy particles, like photons, W and Z, and so on and so forth. So we could think of each of these particles as occupying some position somewhere in the universe, although their position is smeared out by quantum uncertainty, as we talked about. And each particle interacts with other particles repeatedly over time, according to the laws of physics. The smallest possible time interval is called the Planck time, which is determined by Planck's constant uh, that we heard about uh, in the first talk today. And the smallest possible distance is the Planck distance. And this kind of determines the size of a plane square, or actually a cube, since the universe is three-dimensional, on the game board. So this shows a diagram of the evolution of the universe from the period of quantum fluctuations, rapid inflation, development of galaxies, planets, etc. Now, in terms of numbers, this smallest meaningful time, Planck time, is a very small time, around 10 to the minus 44 seconds, and the smallest meaningful distance, the Planck length, is a very small distance, around 10 to the minus 35 meters. On the other hand, the current radius of the universe is a very big number, somewhere around 10 to the 26 meters. Expressing that in terms of these, this fundamental length of time, the Planck length, is a very, very large number. And similarly, the current volume of the universe is a very, very large number. The current age of the universe is around 10 to the 17 seconds, which expressed in Planck times is, again, a very large number. So that kind of determines what the game board looks like. Then what about the playing pieces? The number of fermions in the universe is pretty well known. It's around 10 to the 80th. Number of uh, bosons, that's energy particles, and neutrinos is estimated around 10 to the 89th. There's also dark matter, which we don't know exactly what that is, but likely somewhere in that same range. So we can assume the total number of particles in the universe is around 10 to the 89. So there's a lot of playing pieces and a lot of squares on the board and a lot of possible moves, uh, that is, the time elapsed. So the number of possible outcomes of state vector collapse is like the number of possible moves that God could make. Uh, at each quantum to classical transition. In principle, that's an infinite number, but limiting the choice to a finite number would be sufficient to encompass all outcomes of interest. So why all these numbers? What I'm really trying to say is that the universe is a finite thing. There have only been a finite number of uh, elemental times, Planck times, heavy laps. There have only a finite number of uh, playing uh, pieces in the universe, the particles, and there's only a finite number of of uh, squares on the uh, game board, which is the uh, uh, the positions of particles expressed in terms of Planck length. So everything's finite, even though the numbers are large. And that way we don't have to worry about the uh, uh, logical incoherences that come from infinite sets. So again, the number of game pieces around 10 to the 89th, uh, there's this many playing squares, 
this many potential moves. A moves, that is collapse of the state vector, would occur no more than once every Planck time, but probably much less often. Number of choices of moves is essentially finite. So there's no infinities involved here. So what might God's strategy be if he's playing the universe game? How does he plan his moves? Well, he would pick the scenario that leads to the desired result from the divine standpoint while preserving all underlying principles and deep symmetries inherent in the laws of physics and while ensuring that the results of quantum processes in total follow the probabilities predicted by the Schrodinger equation. What might his goals be? Well, of course, I'm not going to speak for God, but I would guess that one of his primary goals would be to save as many human souls as possible. A secondary goal might be the least amount of overall suffering subject to the constraints of the primary goal, since some suffering, after all, is necessary for salvation. Other goals might be to answer human prayers when it's possible, uh, given the constraints of the primary and secondary goal, or maybe to produce the most educational and entertaining or beautiful scenarios for his beloved creatures. So God, who can deduce the precise outcomes of all physical processes throughout the universe, contingent upon the initial conditions and choices of state vector collapse, would be able to achieve his goals by conferring existence upon his chosen reality from all the potential realities he might create, these potential realities being a sort of multiverse of possibilities that exist only in the mind of God, specifically by selecting the initial conditions of the universe and the choices of state vector collapse that produce his desired reality from the first moments of the universe until the first physical creatures with free will came to exist. This multiverse of potential realities uh, is going to include a lot of different possibilities, uh, something like the Penrose number, which I won't go into here. Finally, we'll talk about how free will interacts with this. Uh, C.S. Lewis came up with an idea of how God could uh, choose physical events uh, in such a way as to interact properly with human free will. And basically his idea was that God knows the future, so he knows everything that people are going to choose to do. He thinks of, he writes this analogy in which he thinks of a piece of paper with a black wavy line that's already drawn, namely the choices of people. He assumes that the original black line is conscious and has free will and chooses the direction it goes in. But whereas a person is only aware of the, what is what is going to happen moment by moment, I, that is God, can see its shape as a whole and all at once. Uh, so the red lines represent physical events adapted to uh, the uh, uh, choices of human beings. And he points out that God can choose the whole course of the red lines in view of knowing the whole course of the black lines, since God knows the future. So let's look at what C.S. Lewis might be talking about. The black line here is a person's life with the path freely chosen over time, and the red lines represent material events chosen by God for a person to encounter during life. So God sees the whole course of our life as we choose it. We choose it moment by moment, but he sees the entire future. And so he can create physical events to interact with us uh, that will work uh, to achieve all of his goals, even though we have free will. But the question is, can God uh, actually uh, know infallibly all the choices that a human would make in various potential situations? The idea that God can do this has been called scientia media, or middle knowledge, by theologians. But Thomas Aquinas rejected this idea. He said, the fact that humans have free will means that God cannot deduce with certainty specific human actions in response to the situations that they would encounter in the various potential realities that he might have enacted by choosing the outcomes of state vector collapse. And I believe that's true. Uh, I'd be on the Dominican side in this rather than the uh, uh, the Jesuit side, which was since Ciencia Media was proposed by a Jesuit, Molina. Uh, but nevertheless, I think we can kind of rescue Ciencia Media in the sense of a probabilistic interpretation. It seems to be clear that with his intimate knowledge of human bodies, brains, and souls, God could have predicted the probabilities that humans would react in a particular way to various potential situations, and from that he could have determined the potential realities that he could enact by divine decree based on the outcome of these human choices. Why do I say that God can do that? Well, because humans can do it in a limited way. 
For example, in a game of chess, a human chess master can anticipate the most likely and the second or even third most likely move her opponent will make at any given point in the game, and therefore anticipate the next move that she would make contingent upon the possible moves of her opponent. She may even be able to anticipate her opponent's next likely move following that move and so on, and thereby look at multiple possible scenarios for the gameplay over the next two moves or even three moves. In this way, she could select her next moves in such a way as to eventually win the game. So if she can do that, God should be able to do it too. God could have restricted his choices of potential realities to those in which key human choices had a relatively high probability. In this way, God could have made reasonable choices among potential realities, and thereby he could have selected the outcome of state vector collapse in such a way as to achieve all his goals for the universe and its human inhabitants without having an exact knowledge of human behavior in response to any given potential situation. So just as a checkers playing computer program can't fail to win the game or at least create a draw when armed with its endgame database of 39 trillion positions representing all possible moves of the computer and its opponent, even considering that its opponent has free will, God could not fail to bring about his goals for the universe and for humans despite permitting human free choices. So the Catechism says God is the sovereign master of his plan, but to carry it out, he also makes use of his creature's cooperation. This use is not a sign of weakness, but rather a token of Almighty God's greatness and goodness. For God grants his creatures not only their existence, but also the dignity of acting on their own, of being causes and principles for each other, and thus of cooperating in the accomplishment of his plan. Well, what about human wickedness? Is that going to derail the plan? Scripture sometimes paints a bleak picture of humanity. And I must say, when I turn on the morning news, I tend to get the same bleak picture. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, doing abominable iniquity. There is none that does good. God looks down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any that are wise that seek after God. They have all fallen away. They are all alike depraved. There is none that does good. No, not one. Well, maybe the psalmist was having a bad day when he wrote that. I do think, however, that God's providential plan is foolproof, since there was previously, is now, and will always be a remnant of righteous people who listen to him and do his will. And here's some biblical quotes about that. Let me just say a few of them. A remnant will return the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And perhaps one of my favorite uh, passages regarding this is from the young teenage queen Esther, uh, who said the very profound statement, O Lord, Lord, King who rules over all things, for the universe is in your power, and there is no one who can oppose you if it is your will to save Israel. For you have made heaven and earth and every wonderful thing under heaven, and you are Lord of all, and there is no one who can resist you. You know all things." So let me just end up here. I know we're a little over time with a Christmas meditation on the Logos. The beginning of the uh, Gospel of John says, In the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Logos is usually translated word, but it could be that also considered to be the reason, or more loosely, the wisdom of God. So the Logos, the second version of the Trinity, is the superintelligence beyond all created reality. He invented the laws of nature and fine-tuned the universe and determined its providential course so that the will of God the Father could be carried out. So he invented modern physics, the Schrodinger equation, and Einstein's field equations. And what did this Logos do? And then, for our sake... He, became, he took the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. He became a baby for our sake and put his entire well-being in the hands of a teenage girl who probably didn't know very well what she was doing. Well, thank you all for your attention. I'm sorry I went over here. And um, I wish you all a very uh, blessed and Merry Christmas. Thank you, Dr. Lagerlin, for your presentation. And now we will entertain questions from our participants. Our Q&A moderator, Sheila Roth, is ITEST Administrative Assistant and board member. Uh, Sheila, it's all yours. Thank you, Sebastian, and thank you to both of our presenters.
Um, we had a number of questions from at least two of our participants here. And I've asked um, Matthias to give me one question from all of his comments that he would like to have answered uh, of most importance. And he said he has a question about the imperfection of creation. If God needs to fear, interfere all the time, how do we have free will? Oh yeah, that's a good question. I think I think the the question uh, has always arisen. Uh, if God knows the future, that means the future must, in a certain sense, be knowable or determined. Uh, how does that allow us to have free will? Um, I think free will doesn't mean that we can ever surprise God. We can't ever do anything that uh, that uh, He is not aware that we were going to do. Uh, the Bible makes it clear that even before a word is on our lips, God knows precisely what we're going to say and what we're going to do. And yet we still have free will. Our, our decisions do make a difference. And uh, uh, we are expected to choose according to our circumstances. And uh, our choices, um, eventually, our choices in terms of moral choices are things that we're going to be judged on. So the fact that God knows the future and God plans the future with his providential plan does not mean that we don't have free choice. Um, part of God's providential plan is what's called predestination, that he has predestined uh, humans uh, for eternal life. And that is a, a doctrine of the Catholic Church, which comes directly from Holy Scripture. And yet it doesn't mean that we don't have free will. Definitely we have free will even though God already has planned which humans will go to heaven and which ones will not. Nevertheless, whether we go to heaven or not is determined by the choices that we make. God may know those choices in advance because he's outside time and looks down upon the whole of the uh, space-time continuum from outside, as it were, and yet uh, our choices do make a difference. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm not sure he had a follow-up. Um, and he said, so how do we have free will then? Okay, well, uh, how do we have free will is something that uh, uh, depends upon how our soul provides the ability to make uh, free decisions, uh, because our brain can't do that. Our brain is a physical system, and it's subject to uh, physical laws. But our soul allows us to make free choices. Uh, and he created us as composite body-soul creatures and giving us that free will, which is one of his most important gifts to us. That free will is not destroyed by the fact that he has a providential plan, because in making that providential plan, he takes into account all of our free choices that we are going to make in the future. I know it kind of boggles the mind that God can do that, but that's God. He's outside of time. He knows the future, and he knows at least the probabilities, I think, of uh, what choices we would make if he had created the universe one way or another. And so he can, in fact, bring about a, a, his providential plan and hopefully save as many people as possible. Okay, uh, thank so you. Can I yes. participate in that question also? Definitely. Yes. Uh, my good wife had a explanation that seemed to me to be very reasonable. She taught history at Carnegie Tech now Carnegie Mellon, taught history of art to uh, uh, and to art students and engineers. And she said when she came into the class after a few days, she was pretty sure which students would get good grades and which would not. Now, she has not influenced them, but she knows what they're doing. They have free will, but she is not guiding them to do it. So that foreknowledge, and in this respect, I go with the Jesuit Molina, not the Dominican, is an aspect of what uh, God knows. In other words, he sees what we're likely to do, but we have the freedom to do that. And with that, I pass. Yeah, and I agree with you. I, I, uh, uh, I, I believe that the uh, Molina's original theory isn't correct that God can know absolutely what we're going to do, but I think he can, like your wife, know probabilistically what people will do. And uh, and so I think scienza media can be, in that sense, um, resurrected uh, or maintained in a probabilistic sense. 
All right, thank you. Mike Oslant has a question here. How does your probability explanation explain the exponential growth and progress of modern civilization in the past 100 years? The probability of such incredible developments over such a short period of time seems impossible. Well, I mean, I think uh, a lot of that is due to human ingenuity in that. Um, what uh, I saw another question pop up also is the question of how do we have free will? If the soul is the source of free will, how does that influence the brain? <laughs> and I think basically uh, that there has to be a connection there. Uh, what connection I would assume is that God actually permits human beings to participate in vertical causation. Uh, in other words, the reality creating it, uh, events, uh, but only in the limited sense that we can create reality in our brains, not in the rest of the universe. Uh, so I think human um, abilities uh, and uh, human thoughts and all uh, have led to the kind of world that we live in. And God, of course, knew that that was going to happen, but uh, he allows us through our free will to make our own choices about the kind of world that we create. Whether it's a good world or a bad world, it's kind of up to us. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Marvin to Dr. Lagerland. What are your thoughts on Dr. Wolfgang Smith's repudiation of evolution, theistic and otherwise, as well as Teilhard's heretical teachings and relative relativity, special in general, and his endorsement of recent six-day creation in geocentrism. Okay, could you repeat the very beginning of that? I, I missed a little bit. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Dr. Wolfgang Smith's repudiation of evolution, theistic yeah, okay. and otherwise? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very good point. I thought that might come up. Um, I, I've read a lot of Dr. Smith's books, and he does repudiate uh, Einstein's relativity theory and so on. Um, I mean, I don't want to uh, in any way, uh, you know, put down Dr. Smith at all. I think he has some very interesting ideas, but I'm borrowing only one of his ideas, uh, the idea about God being responsible for state vector collapse. And it doesn't mean that I necessarily endorse any of Dr. Smith's other views. Um, personally, I, I do believe relativity is correct, and uh, I do believe evolution occurred. But uh, I do think that Dr. Smith's idea about God being the cause of state vector collapse is a brilliant idea, and that's what I'm kind of taking and running with in my presentation here. All right, thank you. Uh, Jerry Chandler asked, uh, quantum mechanics presupposes the Kantian notion of two independent units of meaning, space as a state measure and time as a dynamic measure. This grounding is often called efficient causality. Would the same conclusions follow from material causality as the grounding logical premise of all numbers and calculations? Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure I understand that. Uh, Dr. Curlin, do you, uh, do you understand what they're getting at here? <laughs> Well, I'm not a philosopher. I don't know very much about Kant. And what I know, I do like. But uh, I think there's a, uh, a contradiction here between what uh, uh, special and general relativity tell us about time and space, that they're only defined really as separate quantities for a sp specific observer. So if you go to, if you assume a relativistic uh, interpretation of reality is correct, then I don't think this is a appropriate uh, uh, measure. Now, this represents, in fact, it highlights the fact that there is a, if you want to call it, a contradiction between relativity and quantum mechanics at a very fundamental level. Uh, a lot of people are trying to resolve that in uh, terms of quantum gravity, which I am fortunately not knowledgeable, but uh, there are theories of quantum gravity that says that time is just a construct and doesn't really exist. So this is too deep for me, and I don't want to go into those deep waters lest I drown. But thanks for the question. 
All right, very good. Mike asks another question. God knows the future. So possibility is not really true if God can already determine the outcome. So again, I ask the question, why bother creating anything at all when you already know the outcome? Why does a loving God allow murder, death, war, etc.? Let me speak to that. God created the universe out of love. He created, uh, in fact, I've seen one philosopher, Canadian philosopher, who wrote a very good book on uh, the multi-universe uh, hypothesis and the anthropic, I'm trying to remember his name, but senior moment. But, you know, this is the object. God is love, and he created the universe out of love. And the catechism says, uh, I think this is a good, why did God create us to love him and so forth and so on. With that, I'll pass. Let, let me say that I have an idea as to why God might have created a physical universe. Of course, uh, it's just a conjecture, but uh, there are certain advantages, I think, uh, in creating humans as composite creatures with body and soul and embedding them in a physical universe. And one of these is uh, what I... Uh, uh, would describe as the, the fact that uh, the laws of cause and effect in the physical universe means that humans can learn uh, from their actions. Uh, anything we do affects physical realities around us, with the physical world, and it affects other people through that connection with uh, other people's bodies and so on. And in that way, uh, he's provided us with a, a training ground so I think the physical universe is kind of like a, a training ground, a kind of a boot camp, or eventually a different mode of existence that we will experience up to the end of the world. And in this uh, training camp, uh, we learn that certain actions that we have have adverse consequences for ourselves and for other people. Um, and there's kind of a nice, nice thing about it uh, that... Um, God himself doesn't have to be blamed, <laughs> as it were, for punishing us for certain activities that we do that are uh, sinful. Uh, we kind of create our own consequences because we are embedded in this physical universe governed by laws of cause and effect. Um, the analogy that I, I use is the uh, invisible fence. I've had a bunch of animals <laughs> on our property that are trained by invisible fence. And uh, basically the animals don't realize that we're the ones who invented the invisible fence and put it there to keep them contained. When we train the animals, we bring them near the invisible fence on a, on a leash, and when they suddenly experience that little static kind of shock feeling, we immediately pull them back, and then we hug them and say, oh, you poor thing, uh, we're sorry that that happened. Just stay away from that boundary, and it won't happen again. So we turn out to be like the good guys for the animals. So <laughs> I think by God creating a universe with these rules of cause and effect, uh, in effect, we can learn uh, from the con we can learn from the consequences of our actions without necessarily blaming God for all those consequences. I don't know if that helps answer the question. We're going to take probably one more question here. Uh, this one is from Matthias. How can one claim that state vectors only represent possibilities when they're the things that cause actual interference? Uh, I mean, I could try to answer that, uh, or we could ask Dr. Curlin. But basically, the state vectors uh, do have to interfere with each other as waves interfere. That's where the wave-like aspect of quantum mechanics comes from and why particles behave like waves is because their state vectors uh, contain all these different potential potential outcomes that can interfere with each other so that the probabilities that you predict, like in the double slit experiment, are going to be high in certain regions of space and low in other regions of space. And that's what creates the interference pattern, even though maybe one photon alone is going by at any particular time over a a large period of time that traces out that interference pattern. So the the probabilities uh, do indeed interfere with each other, and they are real in that sense. And even Kastner's paper said uh, that uh, the world of rest potential, potential things is real. It's just not accessible to our senses. There has to be a change in being 
an ontological change from the world of possible things to the world of real things. And that's like when the when one of the light particles eventually makes it through the double slits and hits the screen uh, and is observed. At that point, we know exactly where it was uh, and that quantum superposition of possibilities goes away. I don't know if you want to say anything more, Dr. Perlin. I'm not sure. I don't remember what the question is. My senior moment has taken over. Uh, let me uh, find the question again. I'm sorry. How can one claim that state vectors only represent possibilities when they're the things that cause actual interference? Well, I'm not sure I understand that question because they are all quantum mechanics is a mathematical construct and as is all of physics and it's to help us interpret the world and so when you talk about it being real you're what is so you're thingifying it you're making it a thing whereas it is a mathematical construct that we so i i think that's the way to look at quantum mechanics i think that's the way to look at all physics it's a way of explaining the world there may be other ways we are closer and closer to getting a picture of what the world is about by this mathematics the mathematics works in giving us predictions but to thingify something to give it a reality that it may not have is i think arbitrary and i think in this sense the thomistic uh aristotelian view of quantum mechanics entities as raised potentia is an appropriate way of looking at it. It gives us a picture that is unified and reasonable. Yeah, and I might add that the state vector is a mathematical construct, but uh, according to Kastner et al., it does correspond to some sort of physical reality. Uh, the quantum potentia is a physical reality yeah, it's a reality, but it's not something we can sense. So exactly. people very often distinguish between reality as that which the senses can observe. Uh, who's the uh, Princeton phys physicist who says that if you don't distinguish between observables and things that you observe directly, so that anything observed with a telescope or a microscope or another instrument isn't really real. Only the things you see, touch, feel, and taste are real. Let's see, what's his name? It's a Dutch name. Oh, well, <laughs> I'll pass. Another senior moment. All right, I'm going to wrap up the Q&A at this point. Uh, thank you so much for answering the questions, and I'm going to send it back to Sebastian. Well, all right. Um, wow, the, the, these were some incredible questions, and um, we could probably continue for a long time with them. Uh, what I'd like to do is encourage everyone to read uh, Dr. Curlin's Mysteries, Quantum and Theological, and uh, Dr. Lagerlin's uh, book, which will be coming out this month. It'll be published this year, Brain, Soul, Artificial Intelligence, and Quantum Mystery. I know that we're going to have an opportunity to talk about this again uh, in the near future uh, with another webinar with uh, uh, Dr. Lagerland and uh, another webinar in 2024 also with Dr. Curland. So please stay tuned for the announcement of those dates. Uh, at this point, this wraps up the q and I'd like to thank everyone for your participation in this webinar. I'd like to thank Sheila Roth for moderating the Q&A session and especially Dr. Lagerland and Dr. Curlin for their excellent presentations. In conclusion, our closing prayer will be led by Julie Butler. She is an alumna of Holy Apostles College and Seminary and a doctoral candidate at Pontifex University. Julie? In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, O oh, merciful God, Please grant us your grace, and may it remain with us always, and persevere in us to the end. Please grant that we may always will and desire whatever is most pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>